Hey guys, this is Joseph Mazrak, host of the Blue Deck Podcast. We're approaching the end of season one. Hope you're excited about the conclusion of the season. We're really just getting started with this adventure, and coming up, Charles and his friends are in store for a big surprise. In this episode, I just want to say thank you again to Brian Wages for allowing me to use his music in our intro. Really helps set the mood. Thank you, Brian. As always, if you have questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. You can find me on Twitter at Joseph Mazrak. That's J-O-S-E-P-H-M-A-Z-E-R-A-C. Or you can email me, joseph at thebluedeck.com. I'd really love to hear from younger listeners. If at all possible, I'll try to respond. That's always fun. Also, if any of you have a great idea about what to do on the off-season, I'd like to hear about that, too. For anyone tuning in for the first time, the Blue Deck podcast is in serial format. That means the shows are intended to be listened to in order. Feel free to sample the show you're listening to now, but to follow the story, it's best to start at episode one. Now, here's a recap of chapter seven. Charles and his friends follow Captain Kidd and Marshal Rabin into the woods until they come to a place where a concrete wall blocks their way. The barrier is about eight feet high and extends in both directions through the dense forest. Marshal Rabin hoists Charles onto the wall, and when Charles stands, he is looking out across a vast concrete ring of unimaginable purpose. The inside of the ring is filled completely with murky water. All Charles can think is that it's some kind of abandoned water treatment facility— but even that seems highly unlikely. The Marshal and Captain Kidd probably know the real purpose, but, as always, those two are infuriatingly tight-lipped. The only thing certain is that Marshal Raven is aggravated by this water situation. He sets off to find the pump because the circle has to be drained to get to the shuttle they're looking for. After locating the pump, the Marshal has difficulty starting the cursed machine, so Captain Kidd suggests he go find his own secret door, the one leading into the Red Realm. Here, their paths part. Charles never cared for the gruff cowboy, but Marshal Rabin's departure leaves Charles feeling even more lost in the woods than he was before. Still, there's work to be done, and when they get the pump fired up, Charles' attention is drawn to the forced lowlands which are filling with black swamp water. And now, into the Attic of the World, Chapter 8, The Shuttle. From atop the wall, we watch the water level recede in the stadium-sized circle of concrete. At first, a shiver went out across the surface. Then, ever so slowly, the water began to rotate. This we could only tell by the motions of leaves floating along the edges. Still, there was no way to know its depth. The water was too black. When the water level sunk near the level of the forest ground, I expected to see a floor appear through the thinning murk, but I did not. Instead, what I saw was a single little white bump emerge from the middle of the receding pool. The bump was not much bigger than the backs of the turtles peeking up out of the water. Soon, this bump was revealed to be the tip of a metal post. Still, there was no bottom to be seen, not yet. The water continued to drain past the ground level, and when it was thirty-five or forty feet below us, we saw the post, or presumably it was an antenna, was affixed to a heavy framework of steel beams. Even then I had no idea what we were looking at. Over the next hour, the retreating water revealed more buried secrets. In the center of the gigantic concrete pit, the metal framework stood out from the surrounding water like some sort of tower, almost like an offshore oil derrick, 
and beside it was what looked to be an orange pointy-topped silo, almost like a grain silo. To each side of the silo, white cones appeared in the water. After that, between the cones, fixed to the side of the larger orange structure, a black dome emerged. That was when I started to understand what I was looking at. Not a grain silo, nor any kind of silo. The orange cylinder was a fuel tank. The smaller, white, rocket-shaped cylinders were just that. Rockets! The cowboy had taken us to a shuttle indeed. Not like a bus. The black dome was the nose cone of a space shuttle, and the metal framework beside it was its launch tower. We were looking down on it, far down. Then I realized how deep the hole must be. Already a sense of vertigo seized me when I came too close to the plunging concrete cliff. Where this shuttle had come from, who could say? I was certain all the shuttles were accounted for, and no space shuttle ever launched from my neighborhood. I was certain of that. A shuttle launch could be seen from hundreds of miles away, so if one took off within walking distance of my house, even I couldn't miss that. We watched the water withdraw, and the sunken spaceship was revealed in the bleak depths. Water poured off of it, dead leaves speckled its white surface, and the wings were strung with snake-like vines. All the windows were caked with slime, and the whole thing had a mildly haunted look. Only a fool would think it still capable of flight. Turtles slipped down off the launch pad deck, splashing into the water. I followed one with my eyes, its bobbing head disappearing into a large pipe set into the wall. It was then that I turned around to notice all the forest surrounding us was drowned in water. The huge concrete ring was an island in an ocean of swimming trees. Outside the ring, all the forest was flooded, and inside was a circular precipice. It was like we were standing on the Hoover Dam, if the dam was a circle in the middle of a drowning jungle rather than a blockaded river. Captain Kidd put a hand on my shoulder to steady my nerves. Whistling, he went to the badly dilapidated, very narrow stairway that led along the wall down into the subterranean shuttle grounds. I followed him, William coming after me, then Don. This time it was Ozzy bringing up the rear. The walk was long, and all the while, water drained from the chasm. I could see the whole shuttle by then. All the shuttles looked the same to me, and this one looked like all the rest. The only difference was, this example, well, it looked fake. For one thing, water was pouring out from between the metal panels on its wings, jetting out from the little door near the cockpit, and streaming from the massive bay doors. A real shuttle would have to be airtight. If this thing were in space, all the air would suck out instantly. And it wasn't just the cracks in its skin. But the whole thing looked slightly off, somehow. It looked like a fantasy version of the real space shuttle, but a fantasy from the early 1900s. The basic proportions were right, but the thing was made all wrong. Whatever kind of metal a space shuttle is made of, probably aluminum or titanium except for the ceramic heat shields, this one looked like heavy steel bolted together. All down the white rocket boosters, the curved metal panels were pocked with exposed bolt heads, not smooth at all. And another thing, the seals around the windows, although dirty, were brass, I was sure of it. As the stairway led us winding down the towering perimeter wall, I could read the moniker stenciled in black on the shuttle's right wing. Nautilus. The name sounded familiar to me, but I couldn't place it. Don provided the answer. Wasn't the Nautilus a submarine in 20,000 leagues under the sea? You're right, I said. I guess that makes sense because the real space shuttles are named after important real-life exploring ships. Yeah, William agreed. So why not name a fake underwater shuttle after a make-believe submarine? It's not make-believe, Captain Kidd said, and we all kept walking. The hole we were in, I was beginning to think of it in a new way, like it was the barrel of one of those massive nuclear cooling towers, smelled of sewage drains after a heavy rain. Everything was wet, including us, owing to the Florida summertime humidity and the still air inside the subterranean facility. All around us, everything dripped with condensation. The stairway creaked, ducks flew over our heads, squawking, and below, the turtles were trying to figure out where their lake had gone. We reached the bottom of the steps, and I looked up. 
How odd the sight was, the gray walls towering far above to a perfect circle of bright blue sky. Again, the dizziness came to me, with the curving walls looming large overhead. The proportions were so unusual to my vision it was hard to look at. Standing atop the ring filled with water, I had guessed the structure to be a little over a hundred yards across, but now the circle of sky looked no wider than a dinner table. I supposed, if comparing the walls of concrete to a building, they were nearly the height of a skyscraper, only built downward instead of up. We were in the deepest basement I had ever heard of, especially in Florida where the water table is so high. That explained the pumps and all the drainage built into the place. With my feet planted firmly on the ground, finally the floor I'd been looking for, I could consider the Nautilus space shuttle and its purpose. What is this place? I asked. Captain Kidd turned to me. He too had been staring up at the circular patch of sky. The shuttle is how we get to the next level. Like a video game, Ozzy said. Don was gripping the shoulder straps of her book bag like a nervous parachute jumper. We're going to ride that thing? I could tell by her shaky voice she was remembering the same thing I was. The real space shuttle, the Challenger, blowing up in the sky just a few years prior. The whole country had stopped to observe the disastrous explosion in reverent, horrible awe. A TV had been wheeled into our classroom so kids could watch the liftoff. Then it happened. Had we known what was coming, my teacher could have turned it off. Of course, she didn't know, and the event brought home the stark reality. Space travel was a risky business. Isn't that dangerous, I insisted, but Ozzy was grinning like an idiot and William not far behind. Captain Kidd followed a sidewalk around to a line of windows set into the wall. When he reached a yellow door, he tried the handle. He jiggled it. I heard Ozzy make a screeching sound, but too late, the captain was already twisting the knob. The door shut open with a roaring whoosh as a tidal wave engulfed him. He rocked backwards, water erupting around him. Had he not kept his grip on the door handle, he would have been washed away down the drain pipes like one of the turtles. When the room was empty, Captain Kidd spat out a mouthful of murky water. He was soaked, his brown hair streaking over his eyes. Then he laughed. Should have seen that coming. I tried to warn you, Ozzy said. A fish swam by the window, but that's all right. I needed a bath anyway. Captain Kidd rested his rifle against the wall and let his huge, sodden army backpack, the one with shark teeth dangling from the leather shoulder straps, fall in the puddle at his feet. With his clothes drenched and clinging to him, I saw how skinny he was. He went to the open door, rubbing his chin. I doubt any of these computers work. As he said this, I noticed a sign above the door, Mission Control. We went into the open room. Just beyond the threshold, a catfish flopped on the floor. We um, scooped it up, pushed past Don and Ozzy, and chucked it into one of the pools still disappearing down the drains. With that done, we returned our attention to the control room. Inside were row after row of computers, all set up to allow users to face the algae-tinted windows. Ozzy went to one, running his fingers across the keyboard. It's fried, I guarantee it. He was right. The whole room looked salvaged from the bottom of the ocean. No way the computers would work. Captain Kidd rolled a chair out from behind the desk, plopping down in the wet sponge seat. He tried a power button on a CPU. There was a click, but nothing else. He scooted his chair to the left and tried another with similar results. Doesn't matter. We'll make our calculations the old-fashioned way. At that moment, he looked even younger than my little brother, so it was strange to hear him speak with such authority. I won't lie to you, he said. This will be dangerous, but moving up the decks often is, especially this close to the top. He looked beyond the open door to the Nautilus poised atop the launch pad. The shuttle was held upright by huge clamps on its wings. If it looked abandoned before, now it appeared ready to leap into the air. Maybe that was only a trick of the sunlight gleaming off its wet skin, but I fancied the mist I saw beneath its engines was really smoke. As I turned to Captain Kidd again, he gestured with his chin. It takes a heap of explosives to lift an old bird like that one, but if my calculations are true and I have some good help, I'm sure we can do it. He looked each of us in the eyes. What do you say? William and Ozzy were nodding their agreement, but Don said, You didn't answer Charles's question. 
The girl who took the patch fairy. Who is she? I had forgotten about that. Hey guys, I don't know if you could hear it, but the rain is coming down and I'm not in my usual recording location. I'm in my Airstream trailer, so to me it sounds like rain on a tin roof. In any case, I just wanted to take a moment to send a special thank you to Dr. Jared. I read your review on iTunes this morning. Wow, that was so kind. Thank you very much for the kind words and encouragement and for rating the show. I said it before and I'll say it again. Making these shows is fun, but it's also a lot of work. So when we hear back from our listeners, that really helps us stay motivated. Now, tune in next week for the conclusion of Season 1.